G'day everyone and welcome back to True Footy for a little bit of a later video this week uh, on my round 16 thoughts. Had to think about that for a moment. Uh, the, the season's moving quickly at the moment and uh, yeah, I think that round 17 is just around the corner. It is pretty crazy. Just doing my usual weekly wrap um, on the round that was, uh, save for the two games that I've already spoken about, West Coast um, and St. Kilda, and then of course Essendon and Port Adelaide. I've already done videos on that, so you can find my thoughts on those particular uh, games in those respective videos. Today, we're just going to look at the other seven games that took place and discuss some of the talking points. As always, there were some interesting games coming out of this week, uh, some interesting results as well um, and that are particularly relevant to this year's finals race, particularly that Sydney versus Geelong draw, which we'll talk about. Fremantle failed to get up in a big test to kind of try and rescue their season a little bit and uh, Richmond obviously got pummeled amongst other things. So we'll get into all of that before I get into the round review, guys. Make sure you do go check out the sponsors of this YouTube channel, which is of course manscaped.com for all your male grooming needs you can get 20 percent off and free shipping by simply using the code truefooty20 when you check out on the website so go have a browse the lawnmower 4.0 the nose and ear hair trimmer the weed whacker and all the different kind of liquid formulations to round out your routine you've got deodorants you've got moisturizers you've got body wash now there's cologne uh, it's all good stuff so go check it out and get yourself a discount Cool, so the round kicked off with a beating from Brisbane uh, over Richmond, of course, at the Gabba. It was uh, threatening to be well over 100 points at one point. 134 to 53 was the final score, with Brisbane flexing some muscle and certainly keeping some pressure on the top two, which is kind of an intriguing battle. You've obviously got the top two teams, in my opinion, obviously Collingwood and Port Adelaide, uh, and Brisbane sort of emerging as the clear third team with Melbourne falling away. But they certainly showed that they're still a contender, at least in my opinion, this year. Lockie Neal was fantastic. He had 34 uh, touches. He had 10 tackles, kicked a couple of goals as well. Danaher kicked five uh, and Hugh McCluggage arguably had his best game of the year with uh, 34 disposals at 82% efficiency. So a lot of their guns fired in this game. They are really hard to beat at the Gabba. I did expect this would be a closer game than it eventually was. Obviously Richmond um, missing Dustin Martin for one, but again, I think their list is just a little bit top heavy as I've talked about in uh, in previous videos and it's probably going to get worse. Jaden Short got injured in this game and it sounds like there's a couple of debutants in the coming week for Richmond. They did have a three-game winning streak going into this game that has been snapped, but we do know the Lions are really, really good at the Gabba. Very hard to beat there, and they're seven from seven this year at that ground. One thing that was a little bit eye-catching was the run from defense from Brisbane in particular. Um, you know, Connor McKenna, Will Mott, uh, Coleman, and now Stasovic as well, making it really, really hard for someone like Daniel Rich to find his way back into the side, which is a good situation for Brisbane to be in. Richmond didn't really have a good look in, in this game, to be honest, in particular around the clearance game. This is where they were absolutely slaughtered. They lost the clearances 46 to 22. Taranto had one clearance. Cochin didn't have any. He was named on ball, and Hopper only had a couple as well. So Nankervis with four was the only real one contributor in that particular area. On top of that, their ball movement has been sloppy this year. The 17th in the league for ineffective kicks. They're last in the league for disposal efficiency as well. So not much is going right for Richmond and uh, this was a bad loss. Then we had uh, Sydney versus Geelong, which ended up in a draw, of course, an agonizing draw, probably from a Sydney perspective. At the start of the game, I did pitch Geelong and I would have thought, you know, on paper, Sydney would be happier with a draw out of these two sides going into the game if you'd offered it at the start of the game. But seeing the way this game actually took place, Sydney probably burned more opportunities and it was Geelong that was probably lucky to walk away with two points. I say lucky but bad kicking is bad football and Sydney really let themselves down. I think they had nine shots at goal in the first quarter and only scored one of them. In particular Isaac Heaney had a horror day in front of goal. I remember a couple of set shots that went out of bounds on the full. Robbie Fox I think kicked three behinds and including late in the game he runs into what is a seemingly simple goal from about eight meters out and misses and of course the game ends in a draw. Sydney kicks uh, six goals 18 which tells you the story of their inefficiency in front of goal. They did play well, however, in particular, you know, in addition to, you know, Warner and Golden, who have been fantastic this year. Braden Campbell, Angus Sheldrick, a couple of players that have really bobbed up in the last month or so. For the Cats, Grian Myers was pretty eye-catching in this game. He had 26 possessions and six inside 50s, and I don't recall too many times Grian Myers would have had 26 possessions in a game. I could be wrong on that, but this seems a little bit of an outlier performance for him, so that is potentially something to look forward into the future. He was kicking really well inside 50. Tanner Bruin continues to show a little bit of growth and development. He had 18 possessions and three clearances in this game. Geelong's defense in the second half of this game really clamping down on Sydney uh, was what sort of saved them in this game. It looked like it could have been uglier, but they were a very professional outfit with a good defense. Tom Atkins played a really good role on Luke Parker as well. It was an enthralling last quarter, and while I say Geelong would probably be a little bit more relieved than Sydney would, it was probably a fair result in this game of things. Then we had Adelaide versus North Melbourne, which uh, was a pretty good contest for about a quarter and a half, and then Adelaide really 
uh, put the foot on the throat of North Melbourne, as you would come to expect in a game like this. Adelaide's forward line clicked again. They had seven multiple goal scorers. Tex Walker kicked three. Fogarty kicked four. Rankin kicked five. And then you had a couple of players like Keyes bob up and kick a couple. Phil Thorpe as well kicked a couple as well. And Jordan Dawson was arguably uh, close to best on ground once again. On top of that, Riley O'Brien had a big day in the ruck. He had 52 hitouts, two goals, and six clearances as well. So a lot went right for the Crows. It was a good polished performance, particularly in the second half to kick away against uh, what was a spirited North Melbourne in the first half. They got the margin to about seven points, I think, halfway through the second term. But obviously the better team won out. It's a little bit of a concerning trend here for North Melbourne. They've now lost 13 games in a row. And it does seem, you know, with West Coast being as bad as they are, it's kind of taken a little bit of the microscope of how bad things are at North Melbourne right now. I have highlighted that they've been more competitive in recent weeks. And again, to some extent, that was true in this game. But I'm sure even North fans would agree they need to set the bar higher than simply being competitive. They did have a few positives, though. LDU had another strong inside game. He had eight clearances in this particular game. Taron Thomas has also put together a fairly solid month in his return. And he had two goals and 23 touches. Larky also kicking three goals. Uh, to stay third in the common is a really, really good effort. So on the one hand, North can take some positives out of the first half of this game, but generally speaking, things aren't looking great. The senior players in this game made quite a few errors. And interestingly as well, the North side was more experienced and older than the Adelaide side in this game. Overall, a good win, a percentage boosting win for the Crows and uh, some work to do still to, for North Melbourne. Then we had a game pretty crucial to top eight or potentially top four chances in Western Bulldogs versus Fremantle, which the Dogs ended up winning by six goals. It was a pretty close game throughout, but ultimately in the final quarter when the game was there to be won, the Bulldogs mids really put their foot on the gas and walked away with the victory. There's been a real trend of teams losing after the bye, and this was the outlier to that with uh, obviously the Bulldogs coming out after the bye and uh, looking pretty energetic and ready to go. They made a strong start. In fact, Fremantle only laid two tackles in the first 12 minutes. So while it was a good contest, I think the Dockers will rue some um, lack of opportunities being taken in this game. They had way more possessions. It was four. 105 to 316. So they were overusing the ball, overpossessing it, and really struggled to generate meaningful forward entries. And in fact, eight of their 11 goals came from two players in Walters and Amos. So ultimately, when the game was there to be won in the final term, you know, Fremantle started that last term well with the first couple of goals, and then the Bulldogs midfield really got to work against what is a strong midfield in Fremantle. Caleb Sarong will highlight he's having a great season. He had 34 touches and 10 clearances, but he kind of played a little bit of a lone hand in the clearance stakes because the Dogs won 47 to 34 in that respect. The Dogs keep in touch with the top four, particularly when you consider Melbourne lost this weekend as well, which is a good plus for them. Jamara Ugelhagen is another player whose development is going to be really important for the Dogs going forward. He kicked another four goals. So the Dogs still have a chance to compete for the top four and potentially go deep in September. Should they make that top four, I think that's what it will take. On the other hand, Fremantle, uh, now their season is now on a nice edge and uh, now Fife has now been ruled out for the year, I think, or is, is a chance to be out for the year as well. So things aren't looking great and this would be a frustrating result for Fremantle. Then you had Gold Coast host Collingwood up in Queensland this weekend and the Pies got the job done by 78 points and it was pretty clear from early in this contest uh, that this was not going to be a close game at all and I said during the week I actually when evaluating Collingwood's season this year so far I kind of made the assessment that they hadn't really demonstrated a real killer instinct to put teams away. Uh, and just like that, they've come out and absolutely smashed the Suns on their home deck. The intensity from the Gold Coast Suns wasn't quite there. And this is arguably the biggest test in football right now is playing Collingwood. But Collingwood did make it look like a bit of a training drill at times with the Suns' lack of intensity. The Suns are a strong contested possession side, but they were just blitzed off the park in every single stat, including contested possessions. Jamie Elliott kicked five goals in this game and arguably would have had goal of the round uh, sewn up if it weren't for Dan Houston um, doing what he did on Saturday night. Uh, for the Pies as well, John Noble also put together probably one of the best games of his career. He had 30 touches, which I think is the second highest of his career. He had 529 meters gained and he went at nearly 87% efficiency as well. Dacos also had another huge game. Much to our surprise, he had 36 touches, a goal, and 150 Dream Team points, along with 10 tackles as well. For the Suns, they had a handful of contributors in this game. You know, Anderson battled well with 35 touches and Raul had two goals and 20 touches, but a lot of passing in this game and it was a forgettable day for Stewie Jew and the Suns. They had Hawthorne versus Carlton at the G and Carlton won this game by 10 goals which is a little bit of a surprise. I did tip the Blues um, but they flexed a little bit of muscle in this game and perhaps finally we're starting to see a return to the form that they showed 
in the first month, which wasn't top line footy, but it was certainly, you know, a chance to play finals footy. We've seen a big lift from him over the last couple of weeks, and albeit it has been some average opposition in Gold Coast and Hawthorne, and I know that sounds harsh to Hawthorne. They're a rebuilding side, um, missing James Sicily, but the Blues had lost six in a row. At one point, they'd lost eight of nine games as well. But finally, they've notched some back-to-back wins, which is the first time since round four this season. Pleasingly for the Blues, the midfield did fire in this game. Adam Chera is putting together some really, really hot form, and Patrick Cripps was also pretty large in this game. I think he had 28 touches, 15 of them contested, 8 clearances, 6 tackles, and Chera also had 27 touches, 7 tackles, 6 clearances, and 2 goals as well. So Chera's really, really putting together some maybe not Brownlow form, but potentially best and fairest form, you know, depending on Charlie Kerno. But long story short, this game was over at halftime. It was 8 goals, 7 to 0 goals, 5. So Hawthorne didn't even register a goal in the first half, still showing that Jekyll and Hyde form that we come to expect from young sides, and that's okay because we know that their best form this year has shown that they're on a positive development pathway, but they have lost three of their last four by an average of 55 points, and it may or may not be a coincidence that James Sicily has not played in any of those games. And the last game I talk about this round is Melbourne versus GWS, which was uh, one of the more surprising results, kind of. I suppose you could sort of see it coming with Melbourne's form flatlining a little bit and the Giants having a pretty good resurgence under Adam Kingsley. But of course, it would be Melbourne's inaccuracy that would really, really cost them this game. And it has been a problem for a little while now. They kicked five goals 15 in this game, albeit in difficult conditions. Lately, they've scored eight goals 15, eight goals 18, eight goals 13, and 10 goals 12. So it's been a little while since Melbourne had their kicking boots on. In general, the, the, there seems to be a disconnect a little bit between the midfield and the forward line, um, and generating those scoring opportunities hasn't really been a strong suit of the Demons for a little while now. And obviously, that's exacerbated by Bailey Fritch getting injured in this game, which is a huge blow. And if he's potentially out for you know several weeks or more, that's a huge blow to their premiership chances, to be honest. The fact that Melbourne had 27 more inside 50s in this game is unbelievable, and they've still lost. To generate 73 inside 50s to 46 and kick, what was it, five goals, 15, it's unbelievable. Admittedly, the conditions are what they are, but Melbourne really let this one slip. Unfortunately, they came up against a uh, Josh Kelly who's in some terrific form here. 26 touches, two goals, and most importantly, the uh, the winning goal in the dying minutes uh, of this game with a long-range bomb from uh, around about 50. Tom Green uh, also had 38 touches in this game, and then the other Green, Toby, had two goals and 20 touches. Again, both of those players have been influential all year. Viney battled hard in the you know in the midfield this game. He had 41 touches, and Petrarca was also really prominent with 34 and something like 560 meters gain, but he he kicked four behinds himself in the first half. The other plus point for the Giants that arguably went a long way to them winning this game was the performance of Kieran Briggs, who was facing arguably the most daunting ruck duo in the competition in this game. And he finished with an equal game high, 19 hitouts, five clearances and six tackles. His influence in a game like that would have been critical. And this result, unfortunately for Demons fans, does make it a lot trickier to finish in the top four. They may still get there, but now they're level on points with the Dogs. They are still there on percentage, but it has become a real battle for fourth now. On the flip side, the Giants continue this evolution under Adam Kingsley, and while they are an outside chance of finals, even if they don't make it, they're building a good foundation to A, attract players potentially this offseason, and also, you know, launch into finals potentially next year. So there you have it, guys. Those are my thoughts on all the other games that took place in this particular round. Apologies again, it was a little bit late, but it was a busy weekend, and I was still, you know, making content. So, as always, I welcome your thoughts in the comments section below. Um, got plenty of vids planned this uh, week and then I'm going to Croatia for pretty much a long weekend so not too much of an interruption to uh, the programming on this channel there might be you know a day late here or so for my usual videos but as always I appreciate your support on the channel and I hope you keep watching thanks guys I'll see you in the next one